नमस्कार फ्रेंड्स टूडेज टॉपिक इज आवर इन्वायरमेंट विच इज चैप्टर नंबर फिफ्टीन ऑफ द साइंस टेक्सट बुक फॉर क्लास टेन एज द चैप्टर सजेस्ट वील डिस्कस अ फ्यू पर्टिनेंट इशूज एंड कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ द इन्वायरमेंट इन दिस सेशन टूडे सो लेट एस बिगिन बाई आस्किंग द क्वेश्चन वॉट इज इन्वायरमेंट वी ऑफन से दैट द स्टडी ऑफ इन्वायरमेंट इज परहैप द फर्स्ट कन्वर्जेंस पॉइंट बिटवीन साइंस एंड सोशल साइंसेज it includes physical social cultural and human environment around us if we consider everything around us as a part of the grand universe then after deducting the individual whatever remains is the environment for that individual that is universe minus individual is equal to environment however the individuals and environment don't function in isolation individuals interact among themselves constantly and they interact with different components of the environment while different components of the environment interact among themselves all these have resulted into individuals fashioning the environment while environment impacting individuals all along the history of human civilization and the planet earth we see these interactions happening between individuals and environment these interactions make the study of environment interesting so in this chapter we shall be studying how various components in the environment interact with each other and how human beings impact the environment having said so let us try to understand the concept of ecosystem which is perhaps the most important unit to understand in the study of ecology or environment any unit that includes all the organisms in a given area interacting with the physical environment so that a flow of energy leads to a clearly defined biotic structures and cycling of materials between living and non living components is an ecological system or ecosystem it is more than a geographical unit it is a functional system unit it is the most basic unit for the study of environment the term ecosystem was first proposed in 1935 by the british scientist sir arthur g tansley so let us understand the concept of ecosystem in a more detailed way so for the sake of explanation let us consider the structures and functions of ecosystem one by one however it must be kept in mind that are both are closely interlinked structurally it has two components the first is biotic under biotic we have examples like plants animals human beings microorganisms the second components can be abiotic the examples are sunlight soil air minerals nutrients organic matter water etc functionally ecosystem has two broad functions the first is flow of energy energy flow is one way some of the solar energy is transformed and used by the biotic components for their energy needs while most of the solar energy is wasted as heat energy and goes out of the system as sink energy can be stored but it cannot be reused the second function is nutrient cycling in contrast nutrients necessary for life such as carbon nitrogen and phosphorus and water can be used over and over again and hence it cycles through different components of the ecosystem so for any part of the environment to be considered ecosystem it must have interactions among and between biotic and abiotic components leading to the unidirectional flow of energy and cycling of nutrients through different components for example a pond and an old field and a watershed are examples of ecosystem now depending upon the objectives size of an ecosystem can vary from a small pond to the entire planet now let us now find different types of ecosystems broadly ecosystems are of two types we can say as natural and artificial 
while ponds, grasslands, forests are examples of natural ecosystem, aquarium and agricultural fields are examples of artificial ecosystem. Artificial ecosystems are created by human beings. Ecosystems can also be categorized as terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Terrestrial ecosystems are land based ecosystem such as grasslands, forests, etc. While water based ecosystem such as ponds, sea, etc. are examples of aquatic ecosystem. Terrestrial ecosystems can further be categorized as forest ecosystems, grassland ecosystems, tundra ecosystems, desert ecosystems. They are so termed depending upon the dominant vegetations or typical climatic conditions. Aquatic ecosystems can also be further divided into two types, namely freshwater ecosystem and marine ecosystem. It then brings us to another important dimension of ecosystem and that is the trophic structure of the ecosystem. Trophic means nourishment. So, from the standpoint of how different biotic components draw their respective nourishments, an ecosystem can be considered to be two layered primarily. Number one, autotrophic or self nourishing, that is, the green belt of chlorophyll containing plants who make their own food using sunlight as the source of energy. In the process, inorganic compounds are converted into the organic compounds, which become the source of energy for the heterotrophs, which means other nourishing. So, in this layer, complex matters get decomposed primarily, that is in the layer of heterotrophs. So, in ecosystems, if organisms have similar ways of obtaining the nourishment, then they belong to the same trophic level. Thus, green plants occupy the first level and they are known as producers. Then the plant eaters occupy the second level, they are known as primary consumers or herbivores, while those who consume the primary consumers are known as secondary consumers or carnivores. There could be a fourth level of tertiary consumers or secondary carnivores who consume secondary consumers. It should be noted here that trophic classifications relate to the functions of the ecosystem and not to the species themselves, as any given population of a species may occupy more than one trophic levels depending upon how they obtain their energy. It brings to the other important concepts related to the ecosystem and they are food chains and food webs. They relate to the trophic structures of ecosystem. The transfer of food energy from green plants through a series of organisms that consume and get consumed is known as food chain. As the food energy is transferred, a substantial portion may be 80 to 90 percent of the potential energy is lost as heat. Therefore, the food chains are shorter to keep energy available to the last organisms in the chain. The interlocking pattern of food chains is known as food web. So, in an ecosystem, there are several food chains and these food chains interlinked at different places and then they form food web. Human beings can function both at primary consumers level that is eating plant products or at secondary consumers level that is meat eating depending upon their food habits. Animals that can consume both plants and animals are termed as omnivores. So friends, we studied about an ecosystem, their types, structures and functions. We also got to know about trophic structures, food chains and food webs. So now let us try to observe an ecosystem which may be natural or artificial and write down about them. Go to a nearby pond or an agricultural field which is an example of artificial ecosystem 
or an aquarium, which is again an example of artificial ecosystem and observe for days together and write, write down different structures and functions of these ecosystem and share it in your class or write it in school magazine, wall magazines or in your blogs, etc. Now, this brings us to the other aspect of this chapter, which is how our activities impact the environment. There are three important issues discussed in this chapter. They are number one biomagnification, number two ozone layer depletion and number three waste generation and management. So, what is biomagnification? Human beings have often used pesticides or other such compounds or chemicals to increase the productivity. Some of these chemicals due to their persistence in nature become part of the food chains and then their concentrations increases at each trophic level. Biomagnification refers to the condition where the chemical concentration in an organism exceeds the concentration of its food when the major exposure route occurs from the organism's diet. Human beings invariably at the top of any food chain are the worst sufferers of biomagnification, especially if these chemicals happen to be toxic. Fishes and birds are especially vulnerable as even slight increase in the concentration of these chemicals tend to affect them harshly given their body weight. The other issue is of ozone layer depletion. Ozone or O3 or trioxygen is a highly reactive gas composed of three oxygen atoms. It is both a natural and a man-made product that occurs in the earth's upper atmosphere which is called stratosphere and lower atmosphere which is also known as troposphere. Depending on where it is in the atmosphere, ozone affects life on earth in either good or bad ways. In the lower atmosphere, ozone is a pollution while in upper atmosphere, it plays an extremely important beneficial role by preventing ultraviolet rays of the solar radiation from reaching the earth's surface. UV rays are harmful for the life on the earth. Stratospheric ozone is constantly produced by the action of the sun's ultraviolet radiation on oxygen molecules, also known as photochemical reactions. Large scale air circulation patterns in the lower stratosphere move ozone toward the poles where its concentration builds up. In 1980s, scientists discovered that there had been a substantial depletion of ozone layer in the stratosphere over Antarctica, creating an ozone hole like situation. They also discovered that the chloride radicals from compounds like chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs, which were used in refrigerants and sprays were the main culprits for this depletion in the ozone layer. Soon CFCs were banned. As per the Montreal Protocol, CFCs were banned for use in the refrigerators and sprays. The third environmental issue discussed in this chapter is of waste management. Whatever human beings do, they produce waste. The amount and nature of waste may vary. So, the first thing that can be done is to reduce the generation of waste. The second most important thing is to manage the waste that is to dispose of this waste in a manner which does not harm anyone. And the third important thing is the nature of waste. There are some waste which are acted upon by other organisms and thus can be broken down into simpler components. Substances that are broken down by biological processes are said to be biodegradable. Substances that are not broken down in this manner are said to be non-biodegradable. These substances may be inert and simply persist in the environment for a very long time or may harm the various members of the ecosystem. So, shifting to activities that produce biodegradable waste than non-biodegradable waste is crucial in managing waste. 
Therefore, there are specific ways of handling and managing waste coming from domestic households, municipal hospitals, industrial units, etcetera. In the end, I would urge our students to do some activities at home and school by speaking to their teachers and in collaboration with their peers. Use newspaper, magazine archives, internet to write more about the instances of biomagnification in the recent past or do a literature survey to know more about the latest status of the ozone layer depletion or suggest ways to reduce waste in your home or school. Thank you very much.